<laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Living Blessed, the podcast. I'm your host, Jovan J. Palmer. And as always, we have special guests on who share special and vulnerable moments about their lives, their transparency, and all, all the good stuff that they've gone through and the things that they're doing as well. Got a special guest on, Mr. Sean Bennett. How you feeling, brother? <laughs> feeling good, feeling good. Yeah, appreciate blessed. you for coming back. <laughs> Um, and the misscheduling and all types of stuff, man. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. your just your flexibility and just who you are as an individual. I met you two, three months ago. It was about yeah, yeah, yeah. two, three about months July. ago at the the boot camp, yes, sir. and I was just watching when I had the opportunity to observe you know the room, and you possibly like, yeah, holding work. My son about to come by, you know, if you need him to do anything, just put him work. <laughs> All right, cool. You know, I'm always down for extra free help. <laughs> and you came in. I, I don't know if I gave you directors or what. I don't know what happened, but you did it and you did it well. And it's very rare that people come and execute yeah. on a voluntary basis. And that has to come from a special place, from a support, from not even a special place, you got to be a special person to actually just to want to work like that on a voluntary basis. And just do it well. So before we get into it, introduce yourself, man. Just tell the people who you are, and then we'll just we'll jump into it. Definitely. What's going on, everybody? My name is Ashawn Bennett, uh, CEO of Sean on Instagram. Um, I'm an 18-year-old entrepreneur. I <coughs> primarily trade options, and I like to teach people that are in college or teenagers how they can also trade options as well and have another form of income. <coughs> so you trade stocks. Yeah options all this stuff i still don't get as a 34 year old <laughs> i do not get i have all the apps people say get this i'm like okay cool but i'm like i can't get all this stuff and i don't understand it yeah you can get it but if you don't understand it, yeah it's it's like i'm putting my money just out there into space and i get a little bit but that's just about it like I've bought in a few things, and I'm not gonna say it out loud because they say you shouldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, go, let's. Well, how'd you get into all this, all the stocks and trading options at a young age? That's a good question. So it was about Christmas time. It was December. Mm -hmm. um, I had just came um, out of a prior situation, but I was after that situation happened. I was very focused on entrepreneurship. And that kind of forced me to kind of get in the mindset of, all right, let me start shifting towards, all right, what do I want to keep doing for mm -hmm. the rest of my life or for these next chapters of my life? And for Christmas, I told my parents, I sat them down. I was like, hey, for Christmas, I don't want clothes. I don't want shoes. I don't want no game. I don't want no new controller, none of that stuff. I just want a course on something. I don't care what it is. Hey. Just give me a course on something. So... I was like, just just make sure y'all waste your money. You know what I'm saying? Just get a course on something. How old are you? What it is? 18. At the point you asked for the course, though. I was 17. You want a course for Christmas? That's a good title too. Course for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> a course for Christmas. Yeah. Why? There's I so many other things out there that you could have asked for: a guitar, video games, a car. <laughs> you want a course. I told your father you're different anyway. Because I know that <clears throat> um, information changes situations, and the situation I was in, I wasn't making as much money as I wanted to. So I thought to myself, like, all right, what are wealthy people doing? What are they doing with their kids? Like, how are they operating in the space? And they were attending masterminds. They were attending conferences. They were buying courses, reading books, and they were constantly researching and, like, building and stuff like that. And courses was the most cost effective thing that I knew that they would probably, it was in their price range to probably buy it. And I knew it wasn't like, you know, like tens of thousands of dollars that they had to spend. Mm. So I was like, all right, this is reasonable, a reasonable way for me to start getting information. So the first course that they got me was a stock investing course. Um, it was about 297. It was from Wall Street Trapper, mm -hmm. um, his, in, uh, his investing course. It didn't even teach me about options. It just taught me how to um, dissect the company, how to do yeah. my research, how to do my fundamental analysis, and how to break down <clears> and <throat> the company and just understand the basics of fundamentals, like what makes a company go up or down and stuff like that. So I went through it on Christmas Day, like after I got it, um, on Christmas Day, I went through the entire thing. 
Um, and then the day after, I started um, doing some research on options because I knew options was going to be um, more risky. But yeah. at the same time, <clears throat> it's risky because you might not know what you're doing. Right. So I put all my eggs into like, all right, this is what I'm gonna be focusing on. I spent the whole day like, all right, what is options? Like all the basics, the beginners, the advanced stuff. Like, I even learned some advanced stuff um, that I'm not even teaching in my course yet because I still haven't, you know, played around with it too much. But it was still able to make me money eventually. But we'll get back into it too. Um, I for the next day, it was December 26th and the 27th. I was researching options. So like, how did like, what is it? How do I do it? How do I set up my account? What do I need to do it for? And then all that. So I did all my research that day. I the next day after that, it was the 28th, I believe. It was the 28th, and that's when I decided to do research on the company that I wanted to trade. And that company was Neo. Um, it's a Chinese EV company. And based on where it was, it was about like 40 something dollars, probably about 44, 43. And basically I wanted to do a swing trade on it, which is mm -hmm. a about either like two days to like a few months out. Um, it just ranges, uh, it's a long-term play basically. Okay, okay. So I saw it and I broke down the fundamentals of the company. I was like, all right, this is gonna be good. They have an earnings coming up as well. That could also be a catalyst for it. So I basically caught it up until that catalyst happened and it basically rode up to about, I think $66. Um, and I was able to catch that move. So I took the Christmas money that I got and I put it into the trade, which was about, I think about $580 or so. Um, and I put that in the trade and then two weeks later I sold it for 2041 in about two weeks. And I just learned how to do it in about four days. So in four days, December 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th. And then I made the trade the 29th. On the 29th, you made a profit yeah. over $1,000. Yes. <laughs> it was interesting. Like, and I was at, it was so funny because I was actually in, uh, my class was at 930 and the market opened at 930. So I was just in math class and I was just sitting there and I had like 2,041 just appear on my screen. I remember the exact number too. It was 2,041. I was like. Why am I in class? <laughs> why am I? Why am I here? And then literally, it was like I, re I remember like it was yesterday. It was nine thirty-two. I literally and I logged out of the Zoom meeting. I went downstairs. I told my mom like, "Yo, mom, I just made two thousand on this trade." And she was like, "Oh, that's good. That's good. But are you still in school? Or like, are you still in class? Because I know you got class at nine thirty. I was like. Not, did I you just not just hear what I said? Like, let me repeat. Maybe <laughs> they didn't hear it loud enough. I yeah, was like, yeah, All right. yeah. I just made, I, and I repeated too. I was like, I made two thousand. She was like, that's good. I, I'm, that's good. And she, she had this very mellow tone to, to it. And I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna be happy. You know what? I'm gonna be happy I'm, myself. I'm gonna be happy you're not hearing myself. me right now. It's because she was like, she was downstairs. Um, I, I don't know what she was doing, but uh, she was sitting on the couch. And then I went back upstairs, and I was like, I just made two thousand dollars off of four days of work and I didn't do anything. I was just watching it at that point after I placed the trade, I was just watching it and like, all right. Cause I was up actually a few days later after I placed it, I was up like like four or 500. So I could have sold it right there and made like a hundred percent. But I was like, you know what? Let me just wait until like, you know, wait until like my parameters that I set, let me just wait. And then it was at 2000. I was like, all right, I'm selling this thing. And then I'm just gonna take my profit and just see what I can do with it. So I took half of it and I invested it into some stocks. I took the rest of it, the last 1,000 that I had left over about, and I put that into some more trades. And then I turned that into about 3,000 after about a few, about, about, a, about a month or two, I think. Um, probably about 3,000. And then, yeah, it was about three months. And then the next following week after that three month period, which was probably around like starting to be uh, winter, like winter, spring, kind of late. And I did a trade and it lost me about $1,000. And I was like sick. I was like, I was, sick, I was too. sick. I was like, I lost like a thousand. I was like, on one trade, I was like, ooh, that hurt. So after that loss, I was like, all right, let me just take a break real quick because there's some stuff that I don't understand yet. And um, I know I don't know if y'all know what the disc assessment is. Um, 
but it's like D I S C, and mm -hmm. I'm a very high C, which is um, <coughs> the cautious. Yeah, cautious. Like I'm very like I try to be as systematic as possible. Mm -hmm. Like like when I do like it's step one, two, three, and then it's step one, one point one, one point two. <laughs> every step has a step. Yeah, 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 every step has a step. So that's why I was. I think that was why I was so effective in doing my um like learning about it in four days because mm -hmm. i broke it down in a way that i could understand it yeah, in four that days makes sense. and because i operated like that there were some things that i didn't know so i just started asking myself as many questions as i possibly can like all right how do i mitigate loss what do i like just do a whole bunch of research on different things that i don't know about and then i found out about stop losses a stop loss is basically when you place a trade let's say you enter at a certain price and let's say you don't want let's say you put in a thousand dollars right and you don't want to lose more than 10 percent or let's say you don't want to lose more than 20 percent of how much you put in so let's say you put in a thousand for the trade and then you set a stop loss for 20 percent so the stop loss is at 20 percent of that options trade so if it drops to 20 percent or it tries to go past it it'll exit at 20 percent Mm. which is so you'll only lose like two hundred dollars whatever you set it to because that's twenty percent of one thousand yeah. so if you set it to five percent you only lose what's that like 50 i think like 50 yeah about fifty dollars or something like that depending on where you set it to but you can control that i right, didn't know right. i could control that i was just like in the trade <laughs> and i was like all right i'm just gonna wait for it to go up and then it started going down i was like all right i'm gonna keep waiting <laughs> and then it just kept going down and i was like all right let me just close my position and i was down like i think i was down like like 50 to 60 percent on that yeah. trade and then I, I just wasn't i didn't have the right tools at the time and the knowledge to basically get out of the trade effectively and have proper risk management so when that happened i was like all right let me just take some time to so i took a break i was still in school too so i just like let me just take a break um i still had lacrosse going on so i uh did lacrosse and i would just do research on the side like all right what is like what do i not know right now and I made a whole, I think I have like three or four composition books now um, of just options, notes that I have, whether it's strategies, um, notes about what definitions are, um, just different things that I just picked up and I just wrote them down in the book. And now I'm still, I need to get another one soon because I just I already filled up one other one that I had. Dang. So have you always been like this? Like your entire life has been very like just studious and driven? Yes, but for school because I had my parents. They were they didn't play that like I yeah, had yeah. grades and stuff. Like in school, I never got less than like a three point two usually. Like I always had good grades um, um, in high school and in middle school and elementary school. Like I was always smart. Like mm -hmm. when I was like three or four, I was already like saying my name, writing and stuff like that, and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, at a very like I think it was younger than that. I was I think it was like two or something like that doing that, but. I was always like very studious and I was always very smart and intelligent, but I was also very um, pushed by my parents because they knew I was smart. If, otherwise, if they didn't know, I probably wouldn't have got pushed as hard, but right. because they saw the potential, they was like, all right, you're gonna get good grades. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like no, no exception. Like, right, yeah. right. So, but thankful, I'm thankful for them because they helped me like be this type of person that I am right now. Um, especially like my mom, my stepdad, they actually, they taught me how to they, it was a good balance of both where my mom was very religious and my dad was very like um, down to earth like all right you got to make sure you're doing this this and this and you got to make sure that you carry yourself a certain way like he used to grow up in like DC and Alexandria and stuff like that and like his life was just different from my mom but yeah. at the same time it was a healthy combination to help me be this um because i've gotten like a lot of people saying like i'm an old soul like i'm i'm very mature for my yeah, age yeah 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 um i've gotten that a lot and sometimes i don't see it maybe it's just me but sometimes I just don't see it but um no, i, I just try my agree. best to be rooted got you so like throughout life has there been like any like experiences that you've that have kind of helped shape you into the guy we see today because like a lot of people say oh he just always been this way, but typically is there's like life experiences that shape us into the beings that we are in our current day. Like what's some things that you've experienced that kind of just kind of shaped you into the Sean we see today? Um, let's just say if I was in middle school, I would not be sitting here. <laughs> if you were in middle school. If I was in middle school, I would not be sitting here. Why? Because in middle school, it was actually like sixth, sixth grade up until about 
fifth, actually fifth grade, I should say fifth grade, about fifth grade up until about maybe ninth grade, mm -hmm. I was a very troubled kid. Troubled as in how I carry myself. Cause it wasn't really anybody's fault except mine. Like my mom was over there for me. Um, like, cause my dad left me when I was like a few months old and my mom, like she tried so hard to make sure she provided for me. Um, she like worked two to three jobs, I think. She still went to school and she still paid for me to go to private school. Like she was very like dedicated to making sure that I was good. Yeah. So she worked very hard for me and stuff like that. And I was always grateful for it and I was always doing what I was supposed to do. But at the same time, I think it was when around my, the time my sister died, my youngest sister, mm. um, she was about uh, five years old at the time when she passed away. And I never got to really see her like that as much. But when that happened, I didn't even go to the funeral. Like I was super torn up, like I, thinking about it, not even to fathom, like just going there, seeing that actually for myself. Um, and it was just a very traumatic experience for me. Yeah. And then after that, I get, became a very angry person. Mm -hmm. Like I became very annoying and I didn't want to hear anybody. And I just became a person that I didn't really want. I really wasn't that way before. I was just a very, um, I was very all over the place, very mischievous. But I wasn't really like a bad kid because I was still mm -hmm. smart. But then I started becoming very um, unapproachable for kids and stuff like that. Like I used to always get into fights and get into trouble and get called out by teachers and stuff like that. So my mom always got calls from school like, oh, he got in a fight today or he got in this today. Um, and that carried all the way over. It, it was worse, like the worst in middle school. Um, and they got always put me in punishment and stuff like that. Like yeah. they always punished me. And then it was one day like it got so bad, like I kept. I think I got, I don't know what it was. It was like back to back in one week I got in trouble. And then it, it seemed so tedious, but like they, <laughs> they like made me wear like these certain type of shoes to school. It was like terrible. And I knew that my, like everybody at the school was just going to say something and then call me out. And then yeah. I'd be in another situation because I didn't really hold myself back. Like I wasn't mature. Like I would always like, oh, you got a problem? All right. <laughs> that. And it wasn't like a... <laughs> It wasn't like a see me after school either. Yeah, it was yeah, always it was like, like I site. want people to see me. Like I want people to see either I lose or win. I don't care. I just want all eyes on me at all times. Like don't mess with me. Basically, it was I was always had that energy. And when they sent me to school like that, I was like, all right. So we're not going to class. We're figuring this out. But I got on the bus. Uh, I got on the bus. I made sure nobody saw me. I sat in the back. Everybody got off the bus. I got off the bus last. I got in. I went to the inside of the school. I got on the stage in the cafeteria. I stayed there the entire day. I didn't go to class. I didn't eat nothing. And then Why? When, because I didn't want to go to school class because I knew they were going to say something. About the yeah, they put me they, and then I told them that I could walk. I think I walked. I walked home that day because I wasn't getting on the bus because there was too many kids outside. So I was like, I'm gonna walk home. So after everybody got on the bus, which was like an hour later, I walked home. And then they was like, why are you home late? And I was like, oh, sorry, I missed the bus. And, <laughs> and then they was like, why are you, you look, because I was like crying on the way home. I was so upset. And um, it was like, they and they didn't really care. They was like, hey, you did this to yourself. And at first that made me more angry because I was in this situation. Yeah, yeah, It yeah. made me more angry because I was like, but, I, but then I had a self-reflection moment. Um, when I hit, when I was about to go to 10th grade, cause I from, and also in ninth grade, I was in private school. They put me in the private school. They thought, oh, that would help me too. Nope. <laughs> I still got in the fights there Dang. with everybody there. Like literally <clears throat> the whole, like there was a certain team and then I used to always get into fights with them. Like everybody, like I fought mm -hmm. this one, the six ten dude, like I did not care. Like I, I told was, you, I don't know, like five, eight, five, ten. I don't know. And you fought a how tall was dude? Uh, like six ten. He was like, I did not care. Like, when I tell you, like, I will see anybody, I had no fear. Ashawn, <laughs> what is going through your mind wanting to fight a 6'10", not I saying that you should be scared, angry. but just, like... Because I would not handle things lightly. Like, everybody, if you had, like, an issue with me, I never really handled it lightly. Um, and I really had to get to a... I was, like, very emotionally, like, just not there. Like, it was What was, hard. like, what was the... What was the issue? Because either, I think I was in class and I would always be either, I would be annoying sometimes. <laughs> so it would be my fault. Like it would, I, I own up to it. It was my fault. I was very annoying. And when they came up to me and they said something about it, I basically took it wrong. Like, oh, you're, 
coming for me again. And I felt like, all right, they're targeting me. So I've always fought like it's everybody else's fault but mine. And I always blamed everybody. And it took a real level. Uh, my grandma told me, um, she said, it's going to take a traumatic experience for you to change how you are. Because my mm. mom was trying to change me. She was like crying some days. She was like, I really want him to change, but nothing we've done is working. We put him in punishment, sent him to a different school, and he's still not changing. And my grandma said, she was like, There's, it's going to take a traumatic experience to change who you are. But prayfully, it doesn't have to be too bad where you have to call suicide or something like that because that's mentally, like, that could really mess somebody up. For sure. And my traumatic experience was I got into a fight one day. I think it was it was a fight, and then I got in trouble for it. And I don't remember the exact words that were said to me, but I think it was uh, – I got the acceptance letter into a new school. Um, it was a science and tech program called Oxen Hill, and I got accepted to go there. Um, because of my SAT scores, because I had good SATs. And when I got that news, I was like, all right. I, I wasn't even happy. I was like, yo, this is a whole new school of problems. That's what I was thinking. Because it was literally <laughs> three schools back to back where it was just, it was issues, issues, issues. And now I'm thinking, all right, issues again. But then I was thinking like, all right. So I, I sat down, I was like, all right, well, what did, the, what did all these have in common? This school, I was there, I was here. And I was at this school. All the kids are different. So if it's all different kids, but it's me in every single equation, there's something wrong here. So I look myself in the mirror, and this is kind of where I kind of pivoted. I look myself in the mirror for about four hours, three to four hours, like straight, like just standing there. like. And I look myself in the mirror and three I Three to four hours? And I literally talked to myself and I said, I'm not going to be the person that I was before. I'm not going to have these same issues. I'm not gonna be this person that I was that I don't like. And I'm not gonna have these issues that I keep having. And I admit it like these are my, this is all, this is my fault. This is not their fault. This is not anybody else's excuse. This is not anybody else's issue. This is all me. I need to take full, full ownership and accountability for it. And I gotta own up and I gotta change my mistakes. And I gotta fix it. Otherwise I'm gonna be in the same predicament. How old are we at this time? I was like, what? It was when I was going to the school, so about 10th grade, so probably like 13, 14. Something 13, like 14 years old. And you're seeing your own faults, your own flaws, and who you are and why you pretty much are in the situation that you are in. It took me a while to realize it because, like, that's four years. In my head, that's four years, but some adults be taking 40. Yeah. I was like, the fact that I found it out that quickly, I'm just grateful for it. But after that talk that I had myself, uh, I basically went to the next school, which is Austin Hill, mm. and I got into no fights, had good grades, made a whole bunch of friendships and relationships as well. I played three sports, uh, football, wrestling, and lacrosse, and life was good. I mean, <laughs> like you just said, life was good. I mean, it was just – a pivoting moment for me and obviously that brought new challenges because yeah, like, yeah, right, sure. I just fixed my entire life so that fixed me in terms of the making friends being social and just being accountable and also um, doing right by like me like internally um, so that helped me like with my character and then my next problem was um, relationships Cause I was always like, cause I was like, all right, I'm good now. So yeah, I'm a good character. I'm a good person now. So I may be able to find a, you know what I'm saying? Like a girl or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I always found like great people, like the whole school, like full of smart people and stuff like that. And I definitely did have my fair share of relationships, but there was this one person that I didn't have a relationship with, mm -hmm. but we were like really close friends. Like for the whole time I was there from 10th grade to 12th grade. Um, she was really dope. Um, but she had her own issues and stuff like that too, like that she was like dealing with herself. And the type of person that I became, I became a very empathetic person. Like, all right, you can, you'll get through it, stuff like that. Like, that's just how it was. And I feel like that's kind of why I had so many like different friendships and relationships because I was empathetic. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's a good character trait to have, but it also can be your downfall depending on who it is. Yeah, yeah, like they yeah. Abuse you so or like that. Let's talk about the downfall of it because, of course, we all know about, you know, the benefits to someone being an you know, empath or empathetic towards other people. But yeah. what are some of the downfalls that you have experienced um, 
in your, you know, I don't want to say your line of work, but just more so in your life, should I say. Yeah. So when I became this new person, well, when I like changed and I started being more accountable and I, after that 10th grade, that talk, and then from 10th grade to 12th grade until now, um, I started being more empathetic because I was like, all right, instead of me being like down on people, I'm like, I'm being helpful to people and I'm going to, you know, be there, try to be there for everybody and try my best. Um, and that really helped me because to create friendships and relationships. But at the same time, there were certain people you're just not supposed to be empathetic with yeah. because they can utilize that if they think that it because that if that's what the relationship is built on, that might be an issue. Because if it's built on me giving to you, then it won't be built on you giving to me. Mm -hmm. So it's not a mutual relationship, meaning it's not a friendship, meaning it's just it's a leech and a parasite situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not getting the benefit of it, even though I have a lot of energy and I'm very charismatic and I'm very empathetic about, you know, people and stuff like that. And I have a limit, like, to how much I can, like, you know, keep giving and stuff like that. And I was giving and helping out and stuff like that. And for about, what was it, like one to two years or so? About two years. Um, and eventually she got into, let's just, she got into, she was in her, already in a relationship. And for about, like, a year or two, I think it was about a year. It was just constant calls at night, like, yo, this dude's doing this and stuff like that. And I became that dude. Like, you call if you have an issue. And I was always like, because I was always very mature about a situation. I wasn't always taking it out of context. Like, mm -hmm. why are you doing this? I was always like, all right, this is what, like, oh, like a parent, basically. Yeah. Like, you can come to me and I'll help you out and stuff like that. So that's basically how I was. And eventually got to a point where, um, because we did have a, like a, a weird relationship, friendship thing right. kind of going on. But when she was in a relationship, I was like, nah, that's, that's done because we're not doing that. Like, mm -hmm. like, that's just not right. So basically she, let's just, she came over one day um, and like some, like long story short, some things happened. But first I asked her, I was like, hold up, wait, did you like, are you still in a relationship and stuff like that? Um, and she was like, no, and stuff like that, she lied. And then I kept asking, like, before we did anything like serious, I was like, hold up, are you like, sure? Because I kept asking, because something didn't sit right with me. Yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah. Like, something intuition here. was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like intuition, feeling. like, I don't, mm, <clears throat> like, I know we cool, but I was like, I don't know. Right, so right, right. I kept asking, and I asked again, and then she slipped up, and she was like, yeah, I guess, well, I didn't really fully end it, mm -hmm. but I was like, so you basically, you lied to me, and you're cheating on, <laughs> yeah, so I was like, Nah, and basically I told her like, "Yo, you gotta got peace out." Like that's not right. Yeah, and yeah. And then yeah, the yeah. guy basically called me, and it was a whole situation uh -huh. where it was like, "Like, what are you doing?" Stuff like that. And then the first he didn't believe me, and then eventually it became a situation where you know he started making threats and stuff like that. And I was like, "All right, I'm not about to get caught up in this situation." I'm yeah, of just course get not. It right there. So I was like, "All right, this is the deal. We're just gonna be honest right here." And then. Because I told the truth and I was just being honest about it, he kind of ended it because he was like, wait a minute. Those are some characters, like the characteristics I was describing. He was like, yo, that's very similar to her anyway. So, you know, I'll take your word for it. I'll leave yeah. you. And then right there, I was done. Like, he was like, all right, we're cool. I'm not mad at you or anything like that. I'm glad you were being honest about it. Cool. Situation was over with. Like a few weeks later, <laughs> she <laughs> basically calls me and I was in the phone with my mom. I was in the car with my mom. I just get a call. Mind you, the phone is not on speaker. It's just not on speaker at all. I answer it. I just hear a whole bunch of screaming, <laughs> like from her. And I was like, "You did it!" And I was like, and it was. I was just laughing at it. And I turned to my mom. I was like, "Cause she, cause she knew my mom was like yeah, cool yeah. with like the girl at first, and then eventually it just went down here from there. But it just got insane from there. And to a point, I was like, this was like cool and stuff like that. But at the same time, I was prioritizing you over myself. Mm. Like I was prioritizing like how you felt and just selfish intentions instead of focusing on, all right, what do I want for my life? What do I want for my future? What should my focus be? Right, right. And I had to change that focus. So that was the next thing that I changed. So I my first problem was accountability and just being to myself and not always like jumping at bait and stuff like that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're not going, you know what I'm saying? Like always getting threats and stuff like that. Like I just had to keep to myself and also change my personality and characteristics. And then my next challenge was focusing on um, what my priorities are. And that was able to change through her. And then after that situation happened, that's kind of how I got to entrepreneurship. And that started um, to tr uh, 
transpire in about October, November. And then, like I said, in December, that's when I started asking about that. So October, it was like October to November. I was kind of in a space where I was almost numb after the situation happened because I was like, I can't really trust anybody and stuff like that. Like, because why, you know, why did that even happen? Yeah. Like, we, we, I thought weird. we were friends, yeah. but yeah. And basically, <clears throat> after that whole thing happened, I basically just was numb, mainly like face. I had no energy, no nothing. I was just plain face. Like, even when my parents saw me, normally my parents were like, you know, they would argue with me like, yeah, why are you? But I was always, I was, it was weird almost because I was like, I was doing my chores and stuff. I was getting everything I needed to do done. I was like doing everything I needed to do, but my energy, yeah, my face yeah, just yeah. said like something was wrong and they could just tell. So they didn't have any problems like with your chores. You was like, did you do your chores? Did you do everything? Like, did you, you do just your like, toning just... stuff or something? Like, I was just very <sighs> like, because I wasn't, I just wasn't in the mood anymore, like for anything. And I stopped talking to people for like a very long time. Because I was like, I, I don't want to give anybody else my attention or energy. And I put it all to myself. I started looking up everything <laughs> like real estate like businesses e-commerce yeah. and then stocks too like just like investing and stuff like that like the three pillars with business real estate entrepreneur uh uh the stock market the business so, real estate and stock market those are the big three that, that you are focused built on wealth that, okay okay okay, okay. That built yeah, wealth. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. that's what i was researching so i spent <clears throat> instead of spending my time like you know, just sitting back, not doing anything or just chilling, playing the game and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I decided, all right, I'm going to put my energy into this. And I actually sold my Xbox a while ago. Like, I, I've been stopped playing that. But um, You sold your Xbox? Yeah. It was, I, I think never it was, heard no 18 year old one. He sold his Xbox. Actually, I got it. So when I came down to Atlanta, it was in July, late July. I sold it in August, the first week of August. I was like, I don't need this anymore. Like, what do, what do I need it for? Like, I shouldn't be playing the game when I can make, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and I thought about it, and I'm thinking about it to this day. I'm you like, an Xbox, an Xbox costs like, like what, 300 something dollars, something nah, like that. I haven't played the game. 300 400 years. something dollars. And now that's how much I'm making every single day. So you're profiting $300 a day. At least. On the, the minimum is 300 profit. At least. So break down the whole scope of like, the stocks, the options, and stuff, and how you make the profit because there's like somebody like myself who don't get it. I semi get it because I've been around the conversations for you know some time now, yeah. but it's just I don't get it enough to be like, oh, I want to sit down, watch it, study it, and okay, this is where I need to put my money in. I get it to the point where people are saying, okay, this is the new way of currency yeah. in America, so this is what you need to start doing and start getting it. So I'm, like, I'm trying to get it, but it's just still not making sense to me. So since you're 18, your lingo may be a little different from the people my age. So you may yeah. be helping to understand it a little bit better. So break it down from looking at the charts, all of the ups and downs, all that stuff, and then let's yeah, teach me. So do you know what a stock is? You want a, like a generalized definition yeah, or just, just what a I know? General definition. So a stock is pretty much just like an investment into a business of what they own and the shares that they give to the common general population. Yes, it rep the stock represents the entity that you're actually trying to buy into. Yeah. So Apple or Amazon, if you buy the stock, you pay for that actual, you pay for the actual company. Mm -hmm. And if you buy a share. I mean, you own a part of the company, right? Correct. That's right. the percentage that you own of that company. If they have like 100,000 shares or a million shares and you own one share, that's your ownership of it. So you have right. a part ownership in that company. Mm -hmm. So with stocks, stocks are meant for ownership. Basically, you're meant to own like a certain amount of that company. Um, but with options, you basically have leverage over that company. So basically what it means is, let's say I have a, let's mm -hmm. say um, Apple's 150, $150. Okay. And this, that's the stock price. <clears throat> yeah. So each share of Apple is 150. So if I buy five shares, it's going to cost me 750, et right. cetera. So if it's 150, if I were to buy 100 shares of Apple, I'd have to spend about $15,000 right. just to spend, buy 100 shares. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> so with options, let's say, let's, say, let's say I was to do it with stocks. If I was to buy one share of Apple and I was to sell it at 151, mm -hmm. I'd make a dollar. Right. 
chump change. It's a dollar. <laughs> Nothing. So if I bought it, sold it, made a dollar off of one share. That's if I'm buying trading stocks. That's what trading stocks is. You're buying and selling a stock. Mm. With trading options, options allows you to trade 100 shares of Apple. So if I trade $15,000 worth, which is 100 shares, and if it goes up $1, I make $100. Okay, okay. Because I own 100 shares. So yeah. whatever the amount that the stock goes up, it's multiplied at times 100, and that's basically how much you make. So if it goes up $10 times 100, that's 1,000. If it goes up $1, and it, you don't, you literally made 100 if it goes up $1. So if I make $300 in profit. a day, yeah, in profit, because you're just buying it and then selling it. Um, but you're, the only ca- caveat with options is you have a time limit. So what's the stocks, time limit? Uh, it depends on how much you buy it for. So, for example, if you get a options contract that's closer to the like the date that you're in. Oh, so, break down options. Yeah. So if it's January 1st, right? Mm-hmm. And let's say I was trying to do a scout or a day trade, which is basically trading within one day. So from 930 to 4 o'clock when market closed, trading within that, like buying and selling before the end of the day, that's basically day trading. So if I wanted to day trade, I'm probably, personally, I'm going to select a options contract that's at least maybe one to four days out mm-hmm. in t- at expiration. <coughs> and the, thing, the way they work is expiration is basically like, your, let's say like your iPhone. Yeah. Like it has 100% battery. Like if you have a shorter options contract, maybe two days out, three days out, it'll be quicker for it to deplete from 100% to zero. So after three days, it'll go from 100% all the way to zero. So after three days or two days, however long your contract is, it'll be worth zero dollars. So after that certain amount of time, but you have that, so so you you have have a certain time limit to actually work with it before it actually decreases in value. So it's like a used car in a sense. Basically. So you have a certain amount of time before you, like you can use it for it to actually be effective. So if I were, and that's called theta. Theta is basically how much it takes off. So let's say you do it for two days, like I said. After the first day, around probably 40 to 50% of that contract is gonna be like depleted in terms of value. So you have that amount of time to work with that contract. However, it's gonna be cheaper to get it for short term. So if I were to buy something that's two days out, I could probably get that for like like $100, $200, something like that. And then I could trade it within that same day. And if it goes up a dollar, I'll make my 100 or I'll make my 200. If it goes up two dollars, you know, I'm just trading within a day. But if I were to get one that's 200 days out, Mm -hmm. then that might cost me maybe like a thousand or like 1100, 1200. Because the reason that is because I have more time for it to actually get to that point. So if I have more time, the, the stock market overall goes up. It has a bullish, um, bullish meaning like it goes up over in value over time. Overall, the market goes up maybe like 10% a year overall. So every single stock in the stock market goes up about 10% around that amount. So because they know that the stock market keeps going up gradually over and over and over again every single year, if it goes up a certain amount, that means you have, you're more likely to make money. So that means you're more likely to be profitable. Since they know that, they be like, oh, no, no, no. You're most likely to make money. You got to pay more. What? You got to pay more for it. Because it's like the contract is because I have more time to make money. I have more time for so it. So the more increase. time you have, the more you, you got to pay. pay. The less time you have, the less you have to pay because it's less risky. So what well, you said is less risky. Because let's, say, let's think of it like this. If. If I have a 200, <coughs> let's say, I think, let's say I have a one, so strike, I'm gonna use strike prices. Strike prices are basically a price that I think that the stock is gonna go to mm-hmm. or it's gonna pass after a certain time. So let's say a stock is at 150, like Apple's at 150, and I have a strike price of 152, right? So it's, I need, it needs to hit $2. I have two contracts. I have one contract that has a, um, let's just say three day expiration. And then I have another contract with the 300 day expiration. This contract is not gonna have as much time to hit that $2 mm-hmm. as this one does. Cause like, which do you think, okay, do you think the three day or the 300 day is gonna most likely go up $2 in that time period? So do you think it's gonna take three days or 300 days, most likely? 
So that's how it basically works. So if it goes up, if it go, it can it can go up two dollars or one dollar in that time frame. But it's less likely to happen for in three days than it is for three hundred yeah. days. So you're less risk here, but you have to pay more since it's less risky because you have a better chance of making your money back. So what I do is I trade the shorter time frames, like the shorter time frame <laughs> contracts when uh -huh. I day trade, but I have to pay less. But I trade stocks that have that move more, like yeah. when, during the day. Okay. So since they move, I make profit. So if it moves, let's say I buy it for uh, one day out, two days out, something like that. If it moves my one dollar, two dollar, three dollars, four dollars, five dollars, that's how much I make for that actual contract. And sometimes I buy multiple contracts because I have more money now to use. But that's basically how it works. So there's risk involved with options trading, but I just want you to get accustomed to different types. So let's say somebody doesn't like you know trading all like you know all day and stuff like that. Like oh I got I'm busy. Yeah. So Let's say they want to do something more long term. They can do something called swing trading, which is what I did with my first trade, where I waited about two. I placed a trade, waited about two weeks, sold it. So after I placed the trade, I don't have to do anything else. Um, all I have to do is just like maybe watch it occasionally and see like, all right, where is it at right now? Mm -hmm. And then once I got to a price where I wanted to sell it at, I'll just sell it. So with swing trading, I had to pay five hundred eighty dollars for about I think it was a one month expiration on that contract. And I sold it two weeks in, so I was able to make my two thousand. But at the same time, some of it was kind of taken off in value because I had to wait a little bit, and the theta started to kick in a little bit. So I could have probably made maybe twenty two hundred, twenty three hundred, but because of you know time decay, because I had my contract out for a month, kind of took it off a little bit. That's just how it works. So with swing trading, let's say actually, if I was to get that same contract for maybe like let's say two weeks out. Mm -hmm. It might have been maybe two hundred dollars, and if I got it for one week, I might have been like maybe a hundred or something like that. That's just it keeps getting smaller because it's less likely to hit that price. Like if a stock normally moves like two dollars in a day, it's less likely to move ten dollars in a day, but it is more likely to make move ten dollars in like a month or a year because yeah. it has time to do it. Right, right. So with swing trading, it basically you have to pay a little bit more than you would for day trading, but you get better security because it's like, all right, depending on the company that you're trading, it's more likely to go up in value than it is to not go up that much in value. And mm -hmm. you still, it's just <laughs> less risky overall. Um, if you are swing trading a company or you're trying to swing trade um, a specific stock or something like that, I highly recommend that you do it with a company that's good, like a fundamentally good company. Like, What's a fundamental type of company? A fundamental company is a company that basically has like good base. I want I don't want to say fundamental, but like good <laughs> break down the company. So like for yeah. example, Apple is a great fundamental company. Like it has so much. Like they have about one hundred ninety billion dollars in capital sitting off to the side, so they can pay for whatever they want to basically. So they have like their their debt to income ratio. They have like really good. Um, Fundamentals is basically statistic that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like a almost like a report card. So what did they get an A in their math? Did they get an A in sociology? And this is stuff you can B? find online. Yes. Really? You can research it. But like the reason why it's being so popular now, because you know, our culture is starting to like introduce it to our families and starting to introduce it to our people now. But certain families already introduced it already because yeah. people have been investing for years. The top ten percent of Americans right now own about, I think, 90% of all the stocks, the U.S. stocks, mm -hmm. like 90%, and the top 10% own 90%. So the rest of the middle class or everybody that's below, we don't really own that much majority. Right. So the reason why it's becoming so popular now because ownership is like so important. And ownership in good companies is also important too because if you were to get, um, if you were to put a thousand dollars into Netflix, like 10 years ago, I believe, it would be like $75,000 today. Yeah. Like those returns, like, and think about it. So like those people that put, they have millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and they put that into like a company or they invest it into that company. Let's say they put $100,000 mm -hmm. into Netflix 10 years ago. They're balling right now on that actual, that's one, that's only one company too. There's multiple companies that do that. But the importance is to find a company that has the fundamentals to basically say, all right, this company has 
a great CEO, is as a company has a good management team, they have good fundamentals, they have good, you know, stats and stuff like that. They have a good debt to income ratio. Um, they do good and during earnings, like they, you know, pay their shareholders back and stuff like that. Like simple things like that can identify a company as either good or bad. And once you know that, you already know, all right, I can invest in this company or I can trade this company. Um, and it just makes it so much easier. Dang, you smart. <laughs> like, I get it now. It makes sense. You know, so it's pretty much all in your, your due diligence and your research. Like, if you're a person who doesn't like researching, then you might not. It's you, might you, not might, be a thing. you probably won't win. So it's like you see that you have a mentor like yourself who do you do like, because you, you get a coaching program or is it or just, just a course. course? So you get a course. I'm launching a coaching program, but we're going <laughs> to still, you know what I'm saying? I still got some learning to do, you know what oh, I'm for saying? For sure. So you got the course, and it's pretty much like a, it's like a stocks for dummies in a sense? Basically, I go, so I tailor it to beginners because my whole goal is to teach people that are in high school all the way up until like college. Like, so mm -hmm. that's my audience because, you know, I'm 18. Plus um, some, I started uh, this when I was 17. Older folks like myself who don't get it. <laughs> Definitely, like y'all definitely, and that's the thing. Like, if I can teach it to somebody that's because I have somebody that uh, I gave the course to him for free, um, he's 13, and I told him if I can teach you how to do this and you can learn it and you can actually understand it, then I can teach anybody. Oh, facts. So, if I can teach a 13 year old, I can teach you, I should be able to teach you. I, you just, you yeah. just taught me. <laughs> it's just like, I don't think anybody ever really explained, like, you know, it's all in the research. Because everybody says, so you need to look, like, they always, they make it complicated because it's like, all right, because some people, there's some people that actually um, got my course and they might not do as much research and I can tell because of something, a question that they ask. So some people can ask me an intelligent question about, like, I'll just give you an example. So somebody asked me, I'm just, I'm just making this up. This is super random. Let's say they said, they hit me in the DM, like, they got my course or something like that. And they're like, yo... This stock just did a, I'm seeing a bullish pin bar on Tesla right now. And I'm thinking about doing a call option, but I still need some more confirmations. What would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So they understand candlestick patterns. Of, they understand, like, if you get my course, you understand. <laughs> they'll, they'll understand candlestick patterns. They understand when they should get in and out of a trade. And they're trying to manage their risk in terms of, all right, should I get in or should I not? That's an intelligent question to ask me. If you ask me... Um, if you ask, like, I'm trying to think of a question because I don't want to say like every question is a dumb question, but there's certain questions that you can do research on. Yeah, yeah, so yeah for sure. If someone asks me if they have my course already and they're like, "What is mm -hmm. an in the money option? What is an out the money option or at the money?" That's option? something you can Google. That's something they can that's Google, but it's also something that's in my course that I teach. Yes, yeah, so you ask me these questions, yeah. like you, you just get the course. Yes, yeah, so like, you ask questions that you already know. And I can I, I learned like and the reason I'm so heavy on that is because of how quickly I learned it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like I looked up like I think there was like one video that taught me and I just had questions and I just did more research based on that video. It was like an hour long video and it taught me everything from like what type of contracts they are. But I also had to Put, when I got my feet wet, that's when I was able to actually, you know, learn some of this stuff. And even people that I give the course to that were like, you know, the younger, like 13, 14 and 15, like I want, really want them to understand it. They don't even ask me questions like that. So yeah. I know if they, if they, you know, get it, then you shouldn't be right, on right. ask me that, especially if it's in there. Right. So like right. some stuff like that. But if you don't know, if you, you're a beginner, you don't know anything about it. I'm fine with that. Cause you, you just don't know. You just mm -hmm. like, what is it in my, like, I've heard about it, but I don't know. Like you can Google it, but at the same time, you Google, you still won't get it because you might not understand, it, and that's fine. But right. if you have the if you have the resources to understand it, then I feel like you sh there's, there's just certain questions you shouldn't ask. Like if I go into a room, like if you go into these conferences or you go into a room and you ask somebody a question to try to basically it's a base like a basic question like what is a stock? Like if you come up to me like what is a stock? That's like a simple question you can Google. Like mm -hmm. It's like a, what is a stock? Just type it in Google, it'll tell you, boom. Yeah. But if you ask me what is, like if you ask me like a detailed question, like, all right, um, I'm seeing a symmetrical triangle pattern on Roku, 
Mm-hmm. And I think it might break out above this point. I'm trying to set my price level. Where should I set my price level? Something like something like that is a little bit more like, all right, I understand what this is. Right. And I'm trying to actually, like, I can see you're actually, you know, it's basic research, though. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so much more intricate that I can, there's certain things that, I'll just say it right here. <laughs> Debit spreads, credit spreads, iron condors, butterflies. Like, you probably are like, what the heck am I saying? <laughs> you, you confused. But those are, um, and this is, this is not to confuse y'all. This is not what I do right now. And I actually don't teach this in my thing. I just teach basic, like options trading, buying a contract, selling it. But you can basically do structures, which is when you're buying and selling uh, multiple contracts in a certain way to get a certain output. So I'm going to give you an example. So if I was to do like a, I'm probably going to get this wrong because <laughs> I haven't like studied in a long time. Um, if I do like a debit spread, Let's say, let's say to buy a contract, it costs about twelve hundred, mm-hmm. and to sell a contract, to like to sell the same contract, like because you can buy and sell it. Right. Let's say to sell it, <clears throat> it would be eleven hundred to sell it. So if I bought it and sold it at the same time, I'd have to pay about eleven one hundred dollars because I'm buying and selling at the same time. So what I'm doing is I'm buying the the max profit that I can make, and I'm selling it at the least that it can drop. And I'm basically kind of combining those together. So I'm kind of limiting how much I can make. I better say like. Yeah, it yeah. limits how much I can make, but it limits how much I can lose too. Ah, okay, 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 okay. So I might be able, let's say, for example, I put I send, I spend $100 on the contract. I might be able to make max like $80 on that specific contract, but I'll max be able to lose like $20 on that. But it's like simple stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I learned that. Actually, I learned that in my my four day period when I was just doing research in four days. Like I just learned it then. I didn't do more research on it until like a little bit later after the trade. But I just stuck to what I understood. I didn't understand what is a debit spread. What is a credit? I didn't know all that stuff. I just said, all right, I understand buying a contract, selling it. That's what I'm gonna stick to. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. The first contract I did was swing trade. That was it. I didn't do anything no, cra- crazy like debit spreads, credit spread, because we right. try to make it very complicated yeah. instead of just sticking to what we understand and what we know. You're smart, dude. <laughs> you are very smart. And I appreciate you, man, for breaking it down to me and for the viewers as well and for sharing your moment and your story, man, because it's like, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people think like teenagers. Mm-hmm. They don't have anything special to share or they don't have any moments to share, man. You had a moment to share. You had a situation to share, but you show how you claim came out on top. And it's it's still early for you. Definitely. And you got so much more to learn, so much more to give. But it's just for the fact that you're where you are right now. It's like you're you should be at twenty eight right now. The way you talk <laughs> and the way you act, it's like you're the twenty you're twenty eight year old, but it's your eighteen. So I appreciate you, man. So we're going to do a commercial and then close. I want you to close out some, some positive words, brother. Yes, so this uh, episode is sponsored, as always, by the Emboldened Institute. It is a community where we are just helping people transform their lives through healing. So what I want you to do is text me 404-476-6780. That's 404-476-6780. Sending out daily messages of inspiration, hope, and just wanting you to help you get back on your feet and just options. <laughs> <laughs> you know we all have options man we and you, he just taught us the way of options and building your finances sometimes your finances can put you in a depressive moment but if somebody like a sean can teach you how you can come out of that in the simple way the most simplest way and we said affordable too right yeah it's actually actually i'll matter of fact i'll do a discount for everybody that gets it from this podcast okay if you type in um what you want the discount code to be? Living Blessed. Living Blessed. If you type in Living Blessed, you're going to get a discount on the uh, course. Um, and just be tuned for some other stuff that I'm, dro- I'm dropping. I'm going to be launching a mentorship. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to be taking too many people because I want to be very intimate with the people that are in the mentorship. So, But if you want to learn about options in the most basic way possible, um, I have a lot of analogies in there, too, to make sure you understand. But That's dope. It's very, I, just because I got out of school just recently, I feel like I've still got that teaching in me. Like, I'm still used yeah, to it, like, learning. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I, I don't know why, but I just feel like I'm very tailored to the beginners, and that's just what I'm just... Yeah, that, that's your thing. Suit. That's definitely a thing. I, it's dope. Uh, where can they find the course? 
They can find the course at um, the Options Trading Blueprint, not the options, OptionsTradingBlueprint.com, OptionsTradingBlueprint.com, so O-P-T-I-O-N-S-T-R-A-D-I-N-G, <laughs> B-L-U-E-P-R-I-N-T.com, right. Options Trading Blueprint. Close this out, man. All right, so... I feel like this is really sitting on my heart for some reason. I don't know where it came from, but um, choose choose purpose over profit and choose impact over income. And once you do that, your life will change forever. Because if you focus on money or you focus on trying to make profit and stuff like that, or you try to focus on how much you can make, instead of focusing on how much you can learn, how much you can impact people, how much you can um, devote to other people, like it just, it doesn't make any sense because at the end of the day, like money can, like we print money, like the last, the 40% of all the money that it was in the US was printed in the last 12 months by Biden. I didn't, I learned that fact too, when they print like 40% of it. So it literally <laughs> is like, Inflation is catching up. Like literally, money means nothing. Basically, the only reason that I'm doing it is just because it's a skill set and that I just like it, and I know that it can change lives and I know that it can help people. Like somebody was just on the phone with me today, and she was like, "Yeah, I can just learn this and I can pay some bills with it. Like I can use this to pay off some debt that I have um, on my credit card debt. I can use this to pay off student loans. I can use this to pay for it. Like they have a reason behind it. It's not just for the money. It's not just for that. Even though you can make like a thousand dollars a day from it, the goal should be like, how can I use this money? Because all the money that I got, I didn't spend it on shoes, clothes, anything. I spent it on, actually I spent it too much on like conferences, masterminds, yeah, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Like it's been crazy. I just bought a $3,500, uh, thing from uh i'm not gonna say the name but thirty five hundred dollar uh master class um on an option trading strategy and i learned it and now i'm about to start doing some plays with that but i reinvest all the money that i get into learning more information because i know that information changes my situation and so far i'm in a pretty good situation right now as you can see but it shouldn't matter how much money you make it just matters about how much impact you create and what your purpose is like what are you trying to achieve and what do you want in your life that should be your focus and once you find that all the money in the world will come to you well <laughs> if you didn't know now you know thank you all for tuning into another edition of living buster podcast i'm your host joe von j palmer sean bennett we out peace peace